Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Michael Hare. I'm a researcher at the University of Sydney. And today I'm going to be talking about time series data analytics for housing markets, and in particular, the nonlinear dynamics in housing markets, and whether housing markets have something equivalent to a bifurcation or a tipping point when they come to a crisis. So this work is based on a publication that came out earlier this year with me and one of my colleagues in Expert Systems with Applications. The title of the paper was Detecting Criticality in Complex Univariate Time Series. And in particular, we were interested in whether or not in the housing market of the US, there was a tipping point that bifurcated from one equilibrium point to another equilibrium point. And so this was a contentious issue in the economics of markets as to whether or not there are, in fact, nonlinear dynamics that are out of equilibrium for markets. In the traditional economic theory, most markets, in fact, probably all of markets, do not go through tipping points. They don't suffer from bubbles and crashes as tipping points. What they find is that they should be smoothly varying dynamical systems. Sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease, but there is no, in some sense, bifurcation or tipping point. So the aim of this talk is to present some of our results, illustrate the difficulties in measuring these, these nonlinearities in markets, and then to introduce a new computational technique that extends the previous work of Wagemarker and Cobb. And then I'll present some of the results that we have. So primarily what we have is data um, presented in a time series for an entire country for the housing market. And what we need to do is from that time series, we need to regularize the data in such a way that we're able to analyze it in terms of critical points, tipping points. So we start with this rather theoretical framework in which we have some discounted cash flows from funds. So what we have in this equation is the um, cash flow, which is um, uh, the rental cash flow um, called RT. And then we have the value of housing services in economics, um, which is the, um, uh, the rent less the maintenance cost. And then there's some nominal house price and some fundamental house price and some nominal rent. Fundamental price is not actually observable, and we're going to, tr and we're going to come up with a way to, de de to derive it. Um, and what we're interested in is this index IT, which is the current value of the market divided by the fundamental value, minus one. And this, of course, is going to equal zero when the market is roughly in equilibrium, the price index. Okay. And what this will tell us is what we, we should expect to see in a market in equilibrium. We do some calculations that follow, which are fairly standard calculations in markets, but what we ultimately get at the end is this I of delta T equals I of T minus I of T minus one. So this is the first difference of the price index. So IT is the price index that we're interested in. It's an index of house prices. It's not in dollar terms. It's a non-denominational value that simply measures relative prices and the prices are relative to some underlying fundamental price which is not actually observable but we need to infer it and so this is what the change in the fundamental price would look like if i of delta t is greater than zero then it's a rising market if i delta t is about zero then it's a flat market market is neither increasing nor increasing and if i of delta t is less than zero, then it's a falling market. So if we look at the USA's house price index from the OECD, if we apply the calculations on the previous slide to the US housing market, then this is the index that we get. And what we see with the index is we find from 1992 through to about 1998, we see the market was fairly flat before it started to, to rise. We get to it's about 2002 and the market starts to accelerate. And so for a couple of years there, for about four years, there is a large bull market, a rising market. 
immediately followed by a very sharp decrease um, called the bear market in which there is a roughly constant decrease in the market. And the question is, to what extent is the inflection point at the middle of that, is that actually a tipping point? And so in order to answer that, we need to look carefully at what these price dynamics are in I delta T. What we see plotted here is I T, not the change in the index. And so we'll plot the change in the index um, further on. But a little bit of background in the stochastic dynamics that allow us to start to analyze whether there is something going on in these markets or not. So here we have the change in I of delta T is a um, drift diffusion equation in which we have the rate of change of some potential function, this u function, which is a function of um, the index itself, i delta t, the changing index, i delta t, plus some noise term, sigma dwt, that's a Brownian diffusion process um, on, the, on the end with a, um, uh, with a variance sigma. When the market is in equilibrium, the rate of change of the potential is zero. That's the definition of an equilibrium. In the abstract, we have this theoretical construct of what the potential function might look like. And we need to establish via data analysis whether this potential function um, uh, has strong, strong evidence for its existence within that data within the data that we observe. So in the OECD data, do we see evidence for a potential function like this? And in particular, the equilibrium points, which we see in the very bottom line there, which is the partial derivative of that potential function with respect to the, the changing index. Okay, When that partial derivative is zero, then the market is in equilibrium. And we note that because this is a cubic, then there is going to be potentially one or three solutions to this equation. And each solution to the equation is an equilibrium point. So there might be one equilibrium point, or there might be three equilibrium points, but each one of those relates to a stationary state of the market. This question arises because in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, the question had been asked about whether a stochastic catastrophe which are these models here that we're looking at, could explain either the stock market or the housing market. And so these were questions that were asked by, um, the, um, uh, by a series of economists that wanted to know whether potential functions were the appropriate way to describe the critical points in, in markets. Most importantly, in these markets, what they found were these sorts of dynamics we see, see here on the left-hand side. Notably, on the top left-hand corner plot here, we have the US. And so in this particular example, we see that for the US, as we change this parameter R, we see that the index here denoted Y changes smoothly. We see this for the US, and we see this for Japan. So if we allow R, which is actually a proxy for the interest rate in the market at the time, as that changes, we see that Y changes smoothly for both the USA and Japan. If we pop down to the next um, uh, set of plots for the UK and for the Netherlands, we see that if we change R smoothly now, in fact, the dynamics go over these two tipping points. One is in the UK and there's one in the Netherlands. And so in the analysis, of uh, Dixon Wang in this particular paper, what they argued for was that there was a tipping point in the UK and the Netherlands, but not in the US and Japan. This is contrary to perhaps what we might believe that the US housing market crisis in 2007, 2008, and the, and the market crash in Japan in, 2000, in um, 1989, 1990, weren't tipping points according to um, this research. And so the question is, was there an alternative way in which we could cut this data in such a way that we might actually be able to see the, the actual dynamics over time rather than the dynamics over R, interest rates, actually emerge and see if we can test a hypothesis that there might have actually been a, a, a tipping point in the time series rather than in the interest rate parameterization. And the way in which we think about this 
is that we have some dependent variable x, which in this particular case is our i delta t that we calculated in that first slide. And then we have two parameters, alpha and beta. We don't particularly worry too much about what those parameters are for the moment. But we note that depending on how we vary alpha and beta, we can either start, for example, at B0. And as we change beta, we see that we move from B0 to B1. And then at B1, we go over a tipping point in the equilibrium surface of a market, and we go from B1 to B2. An alternative version of this is where for exactly the same equilibrium surface as depicted in this plot, we can start at A0 and alpha parameter can be the parameter which is moving. And we see that we move smoothly from A0 to A1 without going through a tipping point. And so in both of these cases, we end up around that region for uh, where A1 and B2 are indicated on that plot. But in one path, going from A0 to A1, it's smooth and there are no tipping points. But in going from B0 to B2, there is clearly a tipping point. And we want to be able to distinguish between these. And so if we look at what that looks like in terms of alpha and beta actually changing in parameter space, we can plot what the probability distributions look like in the vertical axis as alpha and beta are changing over time. In the Dixon-Wang analysis, alpha and beta might have been, for example, the interest rates. In our analysis, we want to be able to change alpha and beta so that they are actually time variants. And so implicitly, alpha and beta are functions of time, and we want to unra unwrap that parameterization so that we actually get an explicit value of time. And we see that there are two different dynamics. Alpha zero, uh, sorry, A0 to A1 on the left-hand side is smooth, and B0 to B2 is discontinuous. And that would be a tipping point um, on the right-hand side. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we wouldn't see a tipping point. We were able to convert this into a dynamic, which we can run over our time series. So what does that look like? So here we have a Taylor series expansion of, a, of any potential function. This is true of any time series analysis. We can expand the time series around an equilibrium point. Um, and here the equilibrium point is our stationary I star delta T that we calculated earlier on. Now we expand that out as a Taylor series, and we find that the terms that we can we can discount are going to be the constant term. These have no impact on the, on the change. The rate of change, because we're at around the equilibrium point, is going to be zero. So the second term is now zero. And the thing that we're interested in most importantly is because the market is generically stable, then we want that final term, the second derivative of the potential function with respect to I delta T, is going to be greater than zero. That just tells us that our dynamics are, are locally stable. But that doesn't tell us whether they are globally topologically stable. And that's the bit we want to examine. And now we can find the solutions for those. These are the probability distributions for finding the system in any given equilibrium state. And we can derive this in such a way that it looks um, exactly as we'd expect it to for a normal distribution. And in fact, if we only ever expand things out to the second order term that we see in the very top line of these equations, then we're always going to get only one equilibrium. But in order to do that, we see that we need, for local equilibrium to hold, we need the noise to be suitably small relative to the rate of change of the potential function around there. And that gives us locally sharply peaked equilibrium states. And what does that look like if we have more than one equilibrium state, though? Well, these are the potential functions that require higher order terms than the second order terms that you saw just before. And now we can see that sometimes we have a single equilibrium point, and sometimes we have mutual, uh, we have multiple equilibrium points, depending on the parameter settings for our potential function. And so as time goes on, the argument is that for a non-stationary time series, as one parameter is smoothly changing over time, that change in the parameter results in the emergence of multiple equilibrium points. And as those multiple equilibrium points either emerge or are destroyed, the potential for tipping over one of those tipping points 
increases and destabilizes, globally destabilizes these housing markets. And we want to be able to convert this into something which is a testable hypothesis for the way in which bull and bear markets snap between one equilibrium state and another in, in what we're seeing here. So the top plot here is the equilibrium surface. That's conceptually the framework in which we're working. But on the bottom plot, what we see is the state variable, so X, which is our index, or our changing index in particular, and a probability distribution based on either alpha, beta. Now, alpha and beta in our analysis is going to be replaced by time. So alpha and beta are implicitly a function of time, and we're going to make that an explicit function of time in order to do the analysis. We want to first of all study exactly how volatile these things are. So we first did a whole range of tests of nonlinearity. And what we found was that these systems are in fact exceptionally volatile. So what we measured across 15 different countries, we measured these five different metrics for nonlinearity in these time series for each one of these countries. So burstiness, the Lapinov exponent, time reversibility, the approximate entropy, and the detrend of fluctuation analysis for each one of these time series in order to understand whether they were um, stationary and how, um, how discontinuous they were in some sense. And we found that, in fact, there was no universal measure that appropriately described how good these are um, as measures of description of the nonlinearity. So what we see here, for example, is that France is in fact quite a low complexity, fairly straightforward time series for burstiness, lepidon exponents, time reversibility, and the approximate entropy. But detrended fluctuation analysis, it was exceptionally um, volatile. And so we see these sorts of inconsistencies in some of the data. And so what we did was we took the average across them and did the mean sorted rank of these. And we find that in fact, uh, France has the lowest complexity in the Czech Republic, the highest. And in fact, the UK, USA, and other countries are sort of tend to be a little bit sort of around the middle. And so the burstiness is actually the measure which most closely relates to the sorted mean rank for these. And burstiness is an interesting measure. So if we look at what the bursting measure actually, burstiness measure actually is, it's the ratio of the variance and the means. And what that tells, it, tells you is that there is some dynamic in there caused by changes in the parameterizations of the probability distributions that describe what's going on in these markets. And that's actually exceptionally closely related to what we want to be able to capture. And so I just want to pin this, and we'll move on to how we actually go about measuring whether multiple equilibria exist or not. And so here we have a time series analysis on the left-hand side. So we see a single time series analysis moving over time. And what we do from that is we construct an approximation to the probability distribution of prices at any given point in time. So here, X is the state variable, and that's going to be, that's going to be our, our change in price index. That's going to be what we're going to measure in a housing market. And time is progressing from left to right. And we can construct an approximation to the distribution here. But as our market extends outwards, as our time series extends outwards, if the market moves downwards drastically and stays down, we would observe a multimodality. We would observe two peaks in the price distribution. And that is evidence that there is more than one equilibrium in the system. And the way in which we go about measuring that is to time window the time series so that what we see is we get to single time series um, that has a multitude of different distributions over time that either smoothly change or they discontinuously change over time. If they discontinuously change over time, that's strong evidence for there is a tipping point. And so here what we see is a very short window for the US market. And we see that over a very short window, we see that we get some nonlinear sharp changes. But because the time windowing is so short, we don't see very strong transitions. We don't see the bifurcations that we're looking at. 
So this is four quarter diffusion windows. So the width of the window that we're, we're measuring the distributions over is only four quarters. If we expand, expand it to 20 quarters in that index, we now see distinct bimodalities. So in the bottom right-hand corner is the 1997, 2001, and 2005 um, distribution estimates that are slices from that top plot. And what we see is it goes from having a single mode, which would be standard equilibrium theory from, from market economics, to having multiple modes that occur around about 2001. And in fact, we see a new and very different mode emerge just before the crisis in, in 2007. And so this is very strong evidence that it's multimodal. And in being multimodal, it's switching from one equilibrium to another. And that equilibrium switching is the critical point. It is the bifurcation. And so there is now um, strong evidence for these transitions. And now we can look at the similar sorts of analysis and we see that in Canada, same time series, we don't see the same sorts of bifurcations. There's no tipping point in the Canadian data analysis. New Zealand, again, we don't see any strong evidence. There is a little bit of evidence, but not very strong evidence for bifurcations in the New Zealand market. If we now look at Australia, we see some evidence for a tipping uh, for a bifurcation up to one equilibrium, but no strong um, break later on in the way that we saw in the US. So it diffuses away quite gently. It doesn't actually tip um, from one peak to another as it, go, as it as the market collapses again. And in fact, we can do this across many, many markets. And we can see that the way in which they evolve over time is such that, in fact, the volatility is so high in some markets that in fact the notion of equilibrium that shouldn't hold and that's what we that's what those metrics of nonlinearity we saw earlier on are essentially indicating to us that in fact what we conventionally think of as equilibrium in markets typically doesn't actually hold in a lot of markets and so we see that what actually happened in the us was in fact a true tipping point in the catastrophe theory, potential function theory argument for the way in which these things unfold. Thank you very much for your attention.